Uh, Falter over Father Shach, very core all at most. This is episode five, and I'm delighted to have John Kane from Westmead uh, with me, one of the, the tightest defenders that uh, I came across and played with Westmead through the noughties, one of the successful, the most successful period of Westmead football. John, you're very welcome, and thanks for, for joining me. How are you getting on? Oh, good, Moss. Thanks very much for having me on. You're, you're training at the moment, John. You're involved with Gary Castle, yourself and Gary Dolan. How is that going? Because it's a talk of the country at the moment, and a lot of people are worried, and a lot of people are wondering, will there be any end to the club championship, not to mind the, co- or the county scene? What, what's, your own, what's your own thoughts on it? Um, I suppose it's, it's been tricky, as everyone knows, for the last couple of months. Uh, lads were trying to keep fit and trying to keep going uh, and doing their own bits and pieces. But I'm just hopeful that we'll get to start it anyway. Um, and if we start it, it'll hopefully be completed. But it's, it's, it's tricky as hell. You know what I mean? No one knows what's out there, what way it's going. You see all the clubs kind of closing their activities for weekends and for a couple of days at a time. And we have, you know, every club has their COVID officers in place and there's a lot of boxes that have to be ticked and lads going online and registering and the whole lot. And, we just hope we, we, we can get it started, get through it, and uh, we just want the club to finish anyway. Let the county take care of itself, but we want to try and get the club finished <laughs> anyway. We blame Dublin for a lot of things, John, and there's a lot of fellas in Kerry worried about all the dubs coming down holiday. There's a lot more, I know for a fact, there's a lot more than dubs coming down to Kerry for holiday, but I'd imagine yeah. that you lads would have guys working in Dublin and all that, and would that be a concern for you? Like the players have to actually take ownership themselves and actually make sure that they're okay and be honest in filling out the forms and all that. Is it like how is it like for matches, John, and preparing for it? And you're not even allow simple things like not being able to go into a dressing room to give your pep talk or whatever beforehand. It changes stuff, like doesn't it? It does change, you know. It's good to hear as well that the Kerry boys are still afraid of Dublin, you know. But uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> But it's, I know it does, it changes everything. I mean, you, we have our kind of routine. We're with Gary Castle now the last, this is our third year. And uh, we have a couple of dubs. And we, I would have gone up and Gary would have gone up and we would have had a guy, one of the Gary Castle guys, and the mole would train the boys up there as well occasionally. But most what we found is, or we would have had maybe eight guys up in Dublin last year working away. And now they're all kind of working from home. There's maybe two, three, four max up there on a given week. So there's more of the guys kind of working remotely and stuff. So there's not as much risk, I suppose, coming from Dublin. But with given that we've only played maybe what, two challenge matches since we've been allowed back, we wouldn't usually play that many games at all. But we played two games just to try and get lads back and strength things. But it is totally different. They're talking out under ditches and sides side of pitches and behind stands. And even the simple thing of going to the jacks or finding somewhere to do it. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's a strange situation for everyone, but it's it, it everyone just has to cope with it, and it's, it's like it's like it all. You know what I mean, you just you get on with it, you deal with it, and uh, it'll work itself out. You uh, go into the jacks. Yeah, you just put in. I, I pity the poor man who gets to cross the trot before the game. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think there's a lot of tight. There'll be a lot of tight team huddles in the championship games. I think you know you know yourself what goes on in them, but uh, it'll be. Ah, no, it is. It's a simple little things like that. You know what I mean? And, you know, physios. And it's all well and good in a day like today when it's when the sun is splitting the stones. But, Jesus, when the heavens open, which will happen inevitably during this championship, uh, it's going to be tricky at half time. You're standing, the, the piss is rain, and it's coming down hot and heavy on top of you. And it's, it's, going to be, it's not going to be nice for a lot of people, you know? If you took out the worry, John, if you took out the worry of the, of the, the, the danger of the COVID, right, and getting infected and, and safety, right, are, would you be actually looking forward to this year being better structured in that all the clubs know exactly when you're when with me county board came along and they set up their county championship the fact that they you know exactly when your games are on what day what week how, how much between each game you could prepare accordingly do you think it's something that going forward they have to look at because you've been involved now as you said for the last two or three years and club football is playing second fiddle to inter-county when it comes to fixtures. Like. So this year alone, if the safety is all right, it'll be brilliant for clubs, won't it? Oh, it's brilliant. Like, and I mean, for the likes of Westmead over the years, I mean, I suppose you, you're, you're Kerry, if you're talking about Kerry and Dublin and that, they kind of know they're going to be at the business end of the championship every year. So they can leave off their proper championship until the end of the year. But for a, club, for a county like Westmead, you never know what way it's going to go. You know what I mean? You could have a long season, you could get a run in the qualifiers, you could be out early, whatever way it works. So it's very hard for our county board try and plan for it. But in fairness to them, in the last maybe two to three years, um, they've been very good at giving us the fixtures and stuff. But 
definitely right now we're looking forward to it anyway you know because we had off for so long but if you had your structure like this and you knew that you were having your county player just exclusively for that period of time sure it's brilliant like i mean there's gonna be huge excitement it's just a pity the crowds can't go there's nothing to do about it but there's gonna be massive excitement for you know clubs featuring with their full complement of players and there's a lot a lot of clubs struggle obviously in every county because they have such high numbers of lads and i'd say up in dublin especially over the years there's a couple of clubs that are gunning for it now they've all their county boys back they're big hitters and they're probably looking forward to having a good successful club campaign it makes a huge difference to have the county boys how many county boys would you have with you john uh, it's funny it's funny now you know what i mean like we, we won it last year and we still only have the one in you know jimmy dolan is the only one that's in there um, mm. this year. And Jimmy was the only one that's kind of been in there the last couple of years. The lads have been in and out, but Jimmy's the only one. So we've, we've been very lucky um, from that point of view that throughout our league games and stuff like that, we can we basically have our settled group of players and Jimmy's the only one that has to kind of blend back into it when he comes in. But um, for a lot of clubs, it's, it's, it's very, very different, as you know yourselves, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, geez, I remember when we were going with the belt, it was six or seven of us inside. And it was a kind of a reflection how strong the club were to stay up in Division 1 because we used to, we weren't allowed to play games. But I know from hearing to the lads behind it, the likes of Brian Begley, they're delighted that the county lads are able to train. They can actually prepare properly and they're going to get a right crack at it. And yeah. I think, if anything, and I have a feeling that if there is a successful championship, inter-county championship, let's say everything goes ahead grand, and if there's a successful inter-county championship, John, I think it's leaving the door open fully to say, hang on a second, lads, if he can actually throw up a good championship in the window of two months, why in the name of Christ you need 10 or 11 months to run off what you have at present? Do you reckon there will yeah. be changes if the whole thing goes on? I think there will. They'll, they'll have to look ahead properly. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it's amazing how it's flipped that you have the county managers <laughs> they'll be crying for their club players all of a sudden. You know what I mean? So... Yeah. Uh, but it's a perfect opportunity for the GA. Jesus Christ, like everything has to go to Congress and everything has to be passed this way and that. And it's amazing that something like this has had to force their hand in order to get a structure that works. And as I say, hopefully this COVID will stay away and every club or every county will get their championships off and it'll be massive. And I mean, I mean, if if this wasn't, if it wasn't, if COVID wasn't an issue and if the gates were opened, like the crowds that would be there, if I can, you know what I mean? You could have a junior B match down in the park here in Rosemont and there could be a thousand people at it at the minute. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. There's going to be huge enthusiasm and huge hunger for it, you know? There's a fierce hunger. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the younger lads, I suppose, social media and looking at old matches, but it's the older generation, I think, that are really, really missing out on going to matches, talking about matches having the point inside in the bar afterwards, dissecting the games. They're the fellas that actually yeah. are going to be chomping at the bit to get back. I tell you, John, we were, obviously, since party went up, we'd have a fierce interest in Westmeath. And I suppose before he got involved, my, my I suppose, experience with Westmeath would, would, would have been them beating us in 99 and in the under-21 final. Obviously, the, I, uh, Joe Casey was a buddy of mine in college who was with the, the Miners in, in 95. 95, uh, yeah. Old Joe, yeah, and he was a good footballer <laughs> yeah. and a tough man, a good character yeah. as well. But yeah. before that, John, I, I I remember seeing somewhere where you said that, I know your two brothers played inter-county with Westmead, but from the very beginning, your dad was, was carrying you to matches, going to matches. Was that where the spark was, was kind of lit, or was it always there, or had you other relatives involved, or where... What kind of drove you to, to, to go at the football as much as you did like? Well, I suppose we were, we're we, I'm living in Rosemont and moved back out to Rosemont now since Christmas as well. It's nice to be out here, but it's it's a small village and there was a church, a football pitch and a school and that was it. And there was a pub, a pub came in, I think 2000. And our, our football fortunes went downhill after that for a while. <laughs> they're, on the way, they're on the way back up now, thankfully. But uh, but no, it's, it's a small community and all there is is football. Football, church, and school, and that's it. And it was, it was, it was a huge thing. And my father, um, of course, would have brought us. He, he would have done a lot of travelling during the week, but weekends he brought us to matches. My mother would bring me to trainings. He'd bring me to matches. Mother wouldn't go to matches because no more than any mother, she didn't like looking at her, their kids getting the shite by how them or beating the shite how somebody else. <laughs> so she'd always stay away from the games. But uh, my father would bring me to the games, and it was every game. You know what I mean? It was. Every county match, I mean, I would have thought that Westmead played nobody, only Wicklow, Carlow, Wexford, until I was about maybe 13 or 14, because it was always the preliminary rounds of the Leinster Championships, and it was Division 4 of the league, and that's what it was. But Dave and my brother played 
for he was the first one, I suppose. He was playing. Then Cottle was on the minor team with Joe Casey. Uh, he was full yeah. forward on that one. They won the All Ireland, and I'm sure that was a huge thing in West Mead at the time. It was massive, and the excitement and everything that went on around that was just phenomenal, you know. Um, and then, um, sure, it was just Rosemont had a decent team at the time. You know, happened, they wouldn't have, we wouldn't have senior championship in '89. And I remember being nine years of age and getting the day off school the following day because there was bonfires lit on top of the hill behind us and there was bonfires lit the, down beside the school and on the pitch and everything and the whole lot. And it was it was just a huge occasion. And it was always a thing they got. We would have kind of had a very good team back then, would have had a lot of lads playing with the county, but it would have been seen as a tough kind of battle-hardened team. Uh, it was knockout championship the whole time and never got back, haven't won one since, since 89. And before that, we hadn't won one I think in something like 37 years or something like that. But there's just a huge tradition of football within the parish and everyone, all they do is talk football. And it's funny, for such a small village, there's probably only about maybe, I don't know what there is, there might only be 200 houses in the village itself. But uh, I'd say there's no club in the country that's going to have as big a problem trying to give out 50 tickets <laughs> for the first round of the championship <laughs> match as, as as there is in Rosemont. You know, there's just a huge support. There's a huge grow for it within the community and there's there, there's nothing else ever talked about anywhere only football you know yeah it was very like our own club at home there was no hurling there was no soccer there was nothing there was it was absolutely football all the way um and in schools john was it where you were going to school secondary school or anything like that outside of the club you're the thirst of the the football for the club how what way was the school structure secondary schools and all that in the year you were? Uh, secondary school, well, primary schools, I suppose, would have been the same as the club, but when we got on to secondary school, um, at the time, there was the Carmelite College, which would have been the big kind of college at the time for football back from years ago, but they were amalgamating, there was three schools in Moat were all amalgamating, so they were kind of all over the place at the time when I was going to school, so I was by, I bypassed all of Moat, which is only in the road, and I ended up going to Athlone, um, which was a community college in Athlone. And then repeated in the Maris College, I suppose, when we got bet in the Leinster College's final. But there was, I suppose, we had a community college. They were playing maybe it would have been C colleges at the time. Um, but there would have been a, still a decent standard of us. We said Frankie Dolan would have been in there with us. Two of us were in there together playing together. So we weren't, you know, we had a couple more along with us. But, <laughs> but it was uh, once Frankie stepped in the pitch, he was, he, he was decent enough putting the ball in the back of the net, I suppose. But it was, <laughs> we went on to the I'm Maris there. <laughs> Frankie's a good old character too, isn't he? Oh, Frankie is. A, Frankie's training. He's training Rosemont at the minute, so he is down below. So, <laughs> so it's, it's interesting times, yeah. But uh, so Gary's Gary Gary is training Gary Castle, and he's training Rosemont. So it'll be it'll be, it'll be fun. We were actually supposed to play in the first round of the championship, and it was changed then. So thank God we dodged oh, that one. I, I I don't I don't enjoy playing my own crew. In fairness, so it's uh, it's nice <laughs> not to have. But no, it has to be done. That has to be done sometimes, but I don't enjoy it. But uh, I know we were in secondary school. We got back in a, with the Maris in a college's final, Leinster A college's final. And a uh, good council in Wexford would have been very good at the time. They best went on and went on Ireland. But apart from that, I suppose that was it. There wasn't, I mean, there wasn't the same at the minute. I think you have five schools within Westmead playing A college's football uh, in Leinster, which is huge because there's not a whole lot in the A colleges, you know. And Rochford Bridge actually won the A colleges there last was it Thursday, Friday when did they win it? Was this yeah. I think the yeah, yeah they Luke won that. So. was in charge, wasn't he? Luke was yeah, Luke was in charge, yeah, yeah. Luke was there, a couple of lads and uh, a few more along with him. But it was um it was you know, there wasn't a huge tradition, I suppose. The Maris uh, would have been the big kind of the only ones nearly playing A colleges back then. And I repeated there and we ended up getting back in the final and that was kind of it, you know what I mean? But it was on to college then after that. Jeez, the the before I got get to college, the any time a team does well, and any team we were involved, if you, you can look back, if it's a senior club team where we went well, or if it's a senior inter-county team, you can always trace it back to a certain one or two or three groups being successful. And you had that above in Westmead, didn't you? You had that group that came through with the 95 minors. You had the group that came through, because it was kind of a difference. It was four years of a difference in it, the group that won the yeah. 21 in 99 and then there was another group like there, it, when did you start getting together as like squads with Westmead John did you start at under 14 <laughs> under 16 level when did you start yeah it was I suppose it was under 14 it was funny I remember going off to college and listening to the Mayo boys especially seemed to be ahead of it they were always talking about under 11 development squads and 13 development squads and 14 we just we had nothing like that it would have been you know we would have gone in at under 14 for trials and you know, you're big, strong lads who get picked and whoever else. And I would have played a small bit at under-14 level. 
then under 16 we have a kind of a Father Manning Cup and we would have had a Jerry Riley Cup which would have been two big enough competitions and then it was on to minor up to 21 but um, me minor uh, would have been the first time I suppose where you were probably, probably properly on it and because the minors had won it so I would be minor in 97, 98 I think and the minors had won it in 95 so there was a bit of a buzz about it but um, it was funny we wouldn't have had a great team and because we didn't have it coming up along um, it was it was it wasn't something I remember going to be first training session with the with the minors I'd missed the first session and I think uh, you know the way it was done back then you were brought out even though you were only 17 or whatever years of age and the shite was ran out here doing laps of the pitch four four flags put in the four corners and you were ran and ran and we were training over in Milton Pass I think it was and there was no lights on the pitch or nothing and they were using the lights off the, the street lights it was on the main road the old main Dublin Galway Road and the street lights were shining in and I remember coming to the session. I'd, I'd missed the first session. I came and the boys were like, Jesus Christ, you're not going to enjoy this tonight. And I said, why are saying, no, it's laps. <laughs> and the boys knew I didn't like laps. I was, as I always have, built for speed, not distance. And uh, <laughs> so we didn't like laps. So we were running around and then running around the dark. But it was pitch dark down in the course of the bottom corner, you know, down along the ditch in the corner. And then you come back up into the light again, you'd run, run. So we were running along and there was a good friend of mine, Fieker, was on the panel with me at the time. He was like, come on, we're going to get into this fucking ditch here now. We're going to hide. We're, I'm not doing another lap of this. And I was like, no way. This is my first <laughs> session as a minor county footballer. I'm not going hiding in a ditch. No way. But within about, I'd say, three or four more laps, the two of us said, fuck this. We're getting into this ditch. <laughs> and then we hopped into the, in we hopped into the dark ditch and we rolled into the corner and there was about four or five lads lying underneath of us when we went in. <laughs> so everyone hopped up then, whistle was blowing, we all back in again. But that was their first kind of experience of minor football. It wasn't, you know, when we moved on then, we got to under-21 level with Luke. Um, and Luke, of course, had this aura because he, he had been the All-Ireland winning coach with... Um, with the minors, he had beaten yourselves yeah. uh, in '99. Um, I was repeating in the Maris that year. I wasn't allowed to play. My mother wouldn't let me play because I hadn't done a great job in the first. I hadn't done a great job in the first leaving cert, so she wasn't going to let me ruin the second. One. <laughs> so I wasn't allowed to play that one. But oh, Luke was You must then. have been sick. I was sick, but you're looking. As I said, I, I was. We got to the college's final the same year, and she said to me, "Look, you can pick one or the other. Says you're playing. You can either play under twenty one county football or you can play colleges football." And Look at it, it was it was grand. I, I got to enjoy the crack going down to Limerick uh, to see the boys putting on a show and the whole lot. And sure, it was great to see. It was a great day, not for you now, but it was. It was a super day for oh, us. Oh yeah, it was amazing. Like we we were freaking hell to talk about us coming through. We were after winning it in ninety eight and ninety nine. We said they they already said that we had a better team. And the next thing, geez, we met a wall that day. But do you know that created? If you if you said it now, John, right, and you compared the aura that's around this Dublin team at the moment. He had no, he had no fear of anybody in Leinster that time. Like he had won, he won it in, in two thousand or ninety nine, and then he came again in two thousand, and you won the under twenty one again. So he didn't, you kind of carry that through to senior level, didn't you? That, that you had. Oh, we did, yeah. Of, like I mean, you, you had, you had all, like it was funny because the ninety five team that won the minor All Ireland, and the ninety nine team that won the under twenty one All Ireland, there was very little overlap. You know what I mean? There might have been yeah. four or five lads kind of that that were on both panels. So it was essentially two different groups of players. Um, and then we won, I was on the one team, we won it the following year. Desi kicked the 50 in the last minute to beat me. I think it was something like six points to five or something. So that was another Leinster title that we won. And on the same year in 2000, our minors won the Leinster as well, Bet Dublin up in Crow Park. So really you had, you know, you had four teams within the space of five years that had won, you know, and we, we had two minor Leinsters and an Ireland minor. We had two Leinster and three ones and an Ireland and three ones. So it was a huge group. But apart from that, there was a good core group of serious footballers that had lost the 21 Leinster final, I think, maybe in 96 or 97, you know. So you had a lot of guys there that were very, very solid footballers. And it wasn't just the winning teams that made it up. We just went in and kind of added to the more seasoned guys that had been there. You know what I mean? There was a lot of lads there. There was, you know, like Damien Healy, Paul Conway, Rory O'Connell. Um, there was a lot of other guys like that, Brian Morley, a load of those boys that were just seasoned, hardy, really, really, really good, solid footballers. That if we had gone in as kids in there to try and win something, we wouldn't have done it. Do you know what I mean? Like you needed all them boys as well. Yeah. So, but there was definitely mix, there was yeah. no no fear. Ah, you need to mix, yeah. You know. Was it was zero one your first senior year then? Um. Yeah. Would, would you believe it was in the year we won the Leinster under twenty one? Um, I had started in college in Manute, but it was, we were playing college football. We were playing. I got called into the senior panel, and uh, Brendan Lowry, 
um Shane's dad, you know, is um yeah um he, he was training West Mead at the time and he would have trained my own club as well. Uh, back when I started playing when I was only 16, he was training in Rosemount and then he took over the county. So he actually called me in and back then the league was on before Christmas. So yeah, I don't know if you ever played that. Yeah. If you were, yeah. So we used to play three yeah, rounds yeah. of the league before before Christmas. Um I think it'd start in October or something like that, and you play your three rounds, yeah. and then you take a little bit of a break and then you go again. So I actually play, I was actually involved in the first couple of games before Christmas. But what happened then, you know, I was playing the colleges, you were playing club, you were playing, it was amalgamations, club competition that hadn't been finished. It was about, I remember at a time I could be playing with 12 different teams. With the Sigerson, you could play Fresher, so you could play Sigerson. And I remember just saying, geez, I can't do this anymore. But um, I dropped off, the, uh, dropped off the senior panel at Christmas because it was just too much and we concentrated. Now it, was, it, was, it was hard going on Brendan and I always felt sorry for him because there might have been 12 or 13 of us, say, off the under-21 panel that were also on the senior panel and we probably all dropped off at nearly just to focus on the under-21 because back then, I suppose our focus was we had a really good under-21 team who wanted to try and win an Leinster again because it won the All-Ireland year before. So Brendan was kind of left over Christmas, maybe short, about 10, 13, Desi stayed on with him and a few more, but everyone else just could stake and says, right, we're focusing on the under-21s and stuck with the under-21. That's the way it happened. But I would have played my first league game. First league game was against Wicklow um, in 99, down in Ockram. And such a roast and I never got, or I never wanted to see anyone get ever again. <laughs> it was, I remember we were heading down to Wicklow. We, we, we did the whole full back and I was corner back. I think Fergal Murray, Dermot Brady would have been there. Um, and by, I'd say, 20 minutes to go, the trees were sitting on the bench together looking across at each other. So it was, we got an awful trimming off. And th- th- you know, that was my first experience of it, getting an awful trimming off Wicklow and Division 4 match down in Ockram. So within three it years, we did It wasn't... Trevor Dyle by any chance, was it? Because I got a skinny off him down in Killarney as well. Jesus Christ, he bombed four points over in one half. What was, was his name? Tell me his name. Trevor Dyle. I'll never forget it. Trevor Dyle, yeah. in Killarney. Yeah. And Jesus, like, we were supposed to wipe the floor with these fellas. And uh, I don't know. I saw him. I'd say he played at Leinster after. Do you know, there was always yeah. one or two good players. Ah, we close always had a couple of boys, yeah. Yeah. And it's. Do, do you, I remember in Championship as well, and it happened to me. You came across, like, there was a fair amount of good teams in Leinster that time, John. And you came across Ali Murphy young enough in your career. Jesus and I Christ came across I the first game, the first game I ever played with Kerry in championship was um, 98 and played Cork in Killarney and Aidan Dar. I was taken off at half time. It was the worst. But I'll always say it stood to me like nothing for the rest of my career in that I was yeah. never going to underestimate. I was going to do my homework. I was going to... Did you have some similar experience with... Because Murphy was an off... Oh, geez, he could give you... Oh, he just... if, if, On his day, like... Yeah, I mean, I was only, what, 20 at the time, I suppose, in 2001. And we played Mead. We had won the league. We bet Cork in the kind of Division 2A or something like that final, I think. But yeah, we bet, we bet Cork. And it was a huge thing. We had a great year. You know what I mean? It was Luke's first year in. And it was a great bit of momentum and the whole lot. I went out against Mead. We were eight points up, I think, in the first round of the championships. Uh, or first round of the championships. And Luke had given me the job to mark Ollie Murphy. And do you know what I mean? I was green. I was raw. But I was hungry as hell. And uh, I had marked him. And I'd say it was 65 minutes gone. And he hadn't he hadn't hardly touched the ball. I'd nearly say he hadn't hardly touched the ball. He finished the game with fucking one, two, man, of the match. <laughs> so it was, it was it was the best lesson I ever learned in my life. I remember looking up at the scoreboard and thinking, geez, this is amazing. This is great. We're in Crow Park. You're enjoying the surroundings. And before you know it, he had one, two scored, I'd say, in the last maybe six minutes. Now, it could be, I could be dreaming. I could be dreaming. And maybe, maybe it might have been sooner than that. It could have been 15 minutes. But I always had it in my head. I did a great job for 95% of the game. And then got an outrageous roast. <laughs> but he was just, he was incredible. You know, I'd, I'd say he was probably, you know yourself, if you get an elder kind of guy and that bit of cuteness, he'll always give a young lad a bit of a roast. You know what I mean? No matter how good yeah. that young lad is, when you're green and you're raw and you're just not that focused. But as you say, it was it was the best lesson I ever got in my entire life. I'll never forget it. And he was a phenomenal footballer. Do you know what I mean? When you look back oh, at him, he, he, was, he was incredible. Like, you know what I mean? It was it's it's I wasn't I wasn't glad at the time, but as I said, it was a good lesson. But I met him again then in another Ireland. We met him again in the Ireland quarterfinal, and I went up to Luke and yeah. I said, "Luke, I want, I want to mark him," and he was delighted. Went out again. He roasted me again. <laughs> so, so <laughs> but, 
<laughs> you weren't going to lose so, a third time. <laughs> no, if I was a bit older, I would have, I would have feigned a, a hamstring injury or a broken toe or something. You know, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't cute enough back then to have the sense to say I'm not marking this lad twice in one year. But uh, ah, yeah, look at oh, it. It's, 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 you, you live and learn. I was going to say that uh, Paddy was the first O'Shea you came across, but you actually came across Mark as well in Maynooth. And looking Indeed. at that team, you had a fierce team. You had Woolley, you had Alan Brogan. I'd say if you didn't win a match, John, you had good crack anyway. Maybe that's why you didn't win a match, because it was too many matches. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think you said it there. Woolley was, our, Woolley was our eldest and most responsible individual on the team at the time. So, you know, there, there was always going to be a crack. There was always going to be a bit of crack there. But, uh, ah, no, it's really serious. You, you, Nearly be, you know, there was who was there, sure. Mark Barry Cahill, Cahill, Barry Cahill uh, Alan Brogan, Bernard Brogan, um, David Henry was there, and Deck Lally from Dublin. And we had Carol Ennis from Hilaire, Mick Foley, and Dermot Curry, Connor Moore, and myself and Mark. Who else? Rory Cavanagh, Ross Munley, Woolley. She's the can't. Did you, you, you compete in Sigerson? Like, did you, where's your, did the semi final or? Oh, uh, no, yeah, we get, we, 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 the first year, say, Mark came in the year after me. Um, I think he did a year in CIT first, did he? And came up to uh, Manute then, I think. Or he, he, he had an awful time to go there, John. We had, we had to get him out of there. We had to get him out of there oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you're, 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 you're still in there repairing the damage you did. It, so. <laughs> 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 but uh, he uh, yeah, he came up to it. It was the first year we played the Sigurdsson and sure, there was back then the Freshers could play, but sure, we had a really good Freshers team um, that came in at one time. And sure, there was eight of us on the Sigerson team, which you'd never, you know, it's not allowed nowadays, but there was eight of us start, eight freshers started, to, and Waterford IT, but as Matty Ford was playing, and Declan Brown, and a few more, they would have, Waterford IT were decent at the time. The following year then, I think we were caught on the hop, and then we had two decent years where we, we made the weekend, the last two years we were there, and um, we got beat by, I know we bet St. Mary's up in St. Mary's to get to the weekend, I think, I think UCC could have beaten us. I think it was Galvin's. I think it was Galvin's team. Would he have been playing with UCC at the time? He would, yeah. And they, they made a final as well. They lost a the final, but they made it. Yeah. 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 I'd say that was the year. It could have been it could have been 2002, I suppose, I'd say. Roughly around then. Yeah. Um, but they had a right good team now. They had, I think, Anthony Lynch could have been playing their back for them to a few more boys like that. Mm. But they beat us. But again, sure, look, at we were all, we had all those players, but sure, we had, we didn't know how good we were, I suppose. We were all only 18 19, 20 max. Like, you know I mean, Woolley was probably 22 or something like that. As I said, you know, but it was, it was, um, it was just pure inexperience. We didn't realize how good we were, you know. But if, when you look back yeah. at it and you look at the players, and I probably left out a good few two lads that were, that did play as well. You know, uh, that were exceptional. It's a good competition, John, isn't it? Oh, it's the best. I, I think it's, you know, it's right in between under 21 county football um, and senior inter county. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of Sigerson teams that had wallop. A good few feckin' county teams, um, is, yeah. but uh, um, it was it was unbelievable. It was brilliant. Like I mean, I I absolutely loved our football in college. We we fierce crack all together. You know, we we were. I think lads used to think we were on pub crawls the whole time around Manute, but it was a case of that <laughs> we'd go in, we would get one pint and a beer mat or a pint glass or something would be spilt or a, an old ice cube could be thrown <laughs> behind a bar or something, and we'd be fecked out of one of them. So it was, it, was, it was drink your pint as quick as you could before you got thrown out of it and move on to the next one. But we we had fierce old crack up there, and we'd you know we we had another good year. We got to the we got we got to a semi final, I think in two thousand and three as well, and that was down in that was in Cork actually, and we had right good crack that time as well. But you know it was it was it was a great it's singers and football. You're you know with everyone when they're all living away together and they're in houses and you win a game. Um, you wouldn't have to go back for your county training. You were out here, you know, you could be playing up in Belfast, you could be playing in Cork, you could be playing in Sligo, yeah. you could be off yeah. anywhere at all. And it was the perfect excuse that, you know, you genuinely weren't getting back in time. There was cans on the yeah, bus, yeah, there was yeah. a bit of crack, you were back to someone's house for a few more, then you were tipping back down and back again. And sure, you know, it was it was a great bonding. And because we were all so young, um, it, I'd say it's a lot different than what it is nowadays. And maybe the boys that are playing nowadays to <laughs> tell you something different, but I think. Oh, Jesus, yeah. I think the intercounty well, is probably uh, a bit more serious. Our man, he left CIT, Mark, and he went down doing computers, and I, I, I still think he has issues turning on his phone to this day. Or, <laughs> or he but he barely got out with his degree above in Maynooth, and my dad, I remember, was delighted that he actually got through it, so we're all delighted at that. It was very similar yeah. as well, right? Around that time, Kerry were struggling, 0 one 0 right? And 
Westmeath were probably struggling as well in that I think Meath clipped your wings a couple of years in a row, right? And without going through, yeah. I think Luke was in charge that time. Without going through, I'm going to fast forward a bit here now and I'm going to straight in to when when our our bad, well, say our bad run and your bad run was kind of in, intertwined because when Paddy left us, he went straight up, right? Can you remember? Can you remember when it was announced that um, Paddy was going? Because he told us he was he'd never again manage anybody, and then we found out that he was going up to to Westmead. But can you remember when it was announced that he yeah, was actually I, going I, up there? Yeah, it was. It was. Um... I remember being in the house at home, actually. I remember my father telling me and not believing it, really. I mean, no more than anyone in Westmead because it was such a... T- I think it could have been... Was it only a couple of weeks after he'd left Kerry and the whole... Like, that was That's it. All, yeah. was, you know what I mean? I think I think Dennis Kine or something uh, from Westmead got a lot of credit for... He was the one that picked up the phone and rang him or whatever. But it was it was just a bit surreal at the time. Um, he, he The announcement was made. Party was coming in and all of a sudden there was huge enthusiasm. Now, I hadn't played the year before... Um, I had gone on hiatus. I, I took a year off in 2003 um, because I said I was going to go travelling out to Boston and play a bit of football without the Connemara Gales and play a bit of ball out there for you the summer. Probably, you didn't re- regret that, John. Like, and a lot Not of people, at all, no. Jack no. McCaffrey is similar along that line. You probably enjoyed it and never regretted it and had a great time then, yeah? Yeah, ah, yeah, definitely. I just, I decided, I decided at the end of 2002, right, I'm going to Boston or I'm going to somewhere for the summer. It was my last year of my J1. Um, myself and Graham Norton from Dublin, who was playing with us at the time, and he was with Dublin as well. Two of us decided we were heading off. And out we went. And sure, we were joined out there. Um, um, Desi came out. Desi, after the me game, Desi arrived out. Gary arrived out as well. Another uh, buddy of ours, Paddy Swimber, was out there as well from college. And she's we had we had great old crack. I tell you, we definitely didn't regret it. Um, herself even came <laughs> out with me as well. She came out for after about three weeks. She she followed me out. She must be worried about me. So she came out as well. And uh, we had a great old time. But we came back, got the end of the club season as well. Um, and I just the way I looked at it was um, Luke was over it. And I, again, I felt bad kind of letting Luke down because. I'd have such good time for him, such respect for him. He was eager for me to play, you know, like every lad, play the league and then you can go. And I was like, Luke, if I play the league, I'm staying for championship, you know. So I just said, look at it. It's, yeah. it's, um, that's it. I'm not going to pretend that I'm not going and then leave you high and dry and playing at the beginning of the year. So I didn't play any of the county at all. To all the club I was going as well. And, you know, like yourself, you were getting calls every year to go after that. And I never went that time. So I, I definitely don't regret going that time. It was, it was fierce crack. Um, it gave me a serious hunger for the game again because I kind of I played I suppose I'd done a couple of years under 21s I'd gone straight into senior I was playing a lot of college football and um, even though we were having the crack with the Sigerson we, we still took it very seriously and I had an awful lot of ball played at that stage and I just said fuck this I need a break and it was definitely the best thing I ever did Yeah jeez I can I all, it never kind of came into our heads like to go off for a break but I see young fellas going off now and fellas will be questioning it and Jesus, I, I don't know. I don't know what I enjoy the county scene as much as it was in our time, John. You were you touched on it there with the colleges scene. And it's not that we were mad. It's not that you were out all the time. But I think the balance was no. a bit better. And I think it wasn't like, Jesus Christ, I look at, I look at it now and it is really a six-day week if you're an inter-county player. Um, but I, I want to get into the PO stuff, right? And PO landed up. And was there kind of excitement within the squad itself? Or was there saying, Jesus Christ, this wild man could do anything up here? Or was there <laughs> genuine kind of, this could be good luck? No, we didn't know him that well at that time. We just thought he was great. <laughs> we were delighted, you know. <laughs> but uh, I know he was sure he was super. He was uh it was just huge excitement. As I said, I wasn't on the panel in two thousand and three. I hadn't been there, so it was announced, uh, and next thing there was a challenge or a game of an opening of a pitch up in Dublin was announced. And this is Westmead were playing Dublin and, and I suppose it was more Paddy was playing Dublin. This is why Westmead were invited to it. It wasn't because of our great record or ability written at that at the time. So we went up to the opening of this pitch anyway, but he what they did was Jack Cooney had been in Jack Cooney was brought in as a selector with him. Um, and Jack would have been would have played I would have played with Jack. Jack used to pick me up from Manu to bring me down to training uh, over the years with Brendan Lowry and stuff. And then uh, he was in with Luke Dempsey as well. And everyone knew and loved Jack. And Jack is involved, he's the manager of Westmead now at the minute. He's served his time well. But yeah, uh, Jack what Jack had to send out the texts and all this sort of stuff. So he organized Paddy says, just bring last year's panel. So I think what Jack said to me, told me afterwards was, he just said, we're bringing this lad as well. So it was last year's panel and me 
got to go, even though I wasn't on the 2003 panel. So I headed up anyway. And I remember meeting Paddy. It must have been the City West or something, but I remember it was, I always think it was like a, a, a ringmaster directing a circus or something. <laughs> he was he was standing at the top of the stairs and we were all chatting at the bottom, kind of waiting for him to come. And next thing he arrives up the stairs, he stands, the whole place goes silent. He walks on down, how he lads, big hush and the whole lot. And out we went. And But it was, it was pure awe at the time. You know what I mean? Like you were so used to seeing them. For us to have that man walking down the stairs to say hello to us and, you know, he he was very quiet. You know, he he wasn't going to go around balling and shouting. He just asked a few things, and that was it. And that was my first game, and it wasn't. It was a it was actually a funny game. We we I didn't start obviously uh, because it hadn't been on the penalty year, but it was a lad. Um, I think it was Kenny Larkin was playing full back, and he must have been getting a bit of a hard going from some of the Dublin boys. And Paddy calls me over straight away, and it was only twenty twenty five minutes gone in the match, and calls me over and says, uh, "says Mark tells me you're a good footballer." I says, okay, yeah. And he says, get on there and do a job. I says, grand. There was a little bit of rain at the time and I went jogging onto the pitch. <laughs> I went running on full of the joys of spring, you know what I mean? Ready to impress. And as I was jogging on, my marker just made a little slight change of direction and I went to change with him, slipped, hand down the ground, broke my fucking thumb. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so the next day I was getting all these texts off the boys from college saying, she's uh, you must have had some stinker. And I was saying, why is that? Because it was in the paper, you know, there was a report on the Independent or whatever. It was like, you know, John Cain for Kenny Larkin, uh, 26 minutes. Jimmy David for John Cain, 27 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh, so Jesus. anyway. I was talking to, um, I gave Tomas of Flaherty, I was travelling today and I gave Tomas of Flaherty a buzz and Tomas was a big part of it as well, obviously. And I think, yeah. One of the one I suppose and it comes from the whole Miko kind of era. They believed in hard training, like they believed that you had to do that hard training. Like Tomas told me today, the party told him, this is his exact words. He says, You get from the top of the neck down to their toes right for the start of the championship. And I look after from their neck up for the championship. <laughs> That's what he said but he put in a sand track. Up along whatever pitch oh, Jesus you train Christ. Back. and apparently it was me. fucking awful shit. <laughs> it was horrendous, was it? It was horrendous. Yeah, I remember there was kind of rumors going around that there was sand going in in Balnagore. We always trained in Balnagore, and kind of everyone, everyone loves Balnagore because any any success the Westmead ever had, uh, we trained in Balnagore. It's a it's, it's a great club. They're a junior club, but uh, you know they would have had success. They would have had senior intermediate, but. They're, but there was rumour going around that there was sand going to Balnagore. And we were like, what in the name of Jesus? Is there sand going to Balnagore for? And we arrived out one day and there was that depth of sand. I don't know how many, I don't know how they got it in. I don't know how the lorries got it out. I don't know if Paddy brought guys up to shovel it for him or what happened. But there was sand the whole way, say, from behind the goals, uh, right up around, along probably about maybe 10 yards wide, 15 yards wide, the whole way right up to the far corner of the pitch, outside of the pill. And by Jesus, we ran and ran and ran. We used to go, and it was it was horrendous stuff because we, you know, you'd have the likes of Dennis Glennon was probably only whatever was he, eighteen at the time, and he was a little ferret, and he, he probably weighing about seventy kg, and he gliding across it, and the rest was chasing after him <laughs> like greyhounds after after a hare. But it was it was you'd come off the pitch, you could do I just I don't know what we did. We could have done 16, 20 of them. And you'd walk back off the pitch and you'd nearly float up into the air, stepping back onto the pitch. Your feet and your legs were that heavy. And when you stepped back onto the pitch, you felt like you were walking on air, you know. But that was it. And then he'd make us do, we were into our wire and wires. And Tomas was unbelievable. You know what I mean? He was, he yeah. was, he was like a real, he was a real sergeant major. He, he just took no shit from anyone. He trained you very, very, yeah, very hard. That. Very hard, you know. He said that, Paddy told him, he says, we'll have to, we'll have to plan we'll have to have a different plan, he says, for these fellas. He says, I'll be, we'll have to go good cop, bad cop. He said to Tomas, and he said, Tomas, you'll be the bad cop and I'll be the good cop. Tomas didn't mind that. He came not to you, I think. <laughs> I, I, was, was, sure. I was, go on. Paddy, uh, he, he was, when we were doing all that at the time, I remember for, when I, I, I actually, after I broke my thumb, I went travelling for a month to Australia and I came back <laughs> in January. And the Burren Cup was on. There was about five rounds of the Burren Cup. And then there was two rounds of the league. But I didn't actually make a panel until the third round of the league. So I didn't make any of the games for the Burren Cup. Didn't make any of the games for the first round of the league. But what they used to do was, 
on the Thursday night that we trained beforehand, um, Paddy would take the kind of boys that hadn't made the panel. So you'd know on the Thursday night if you were on the panel for the weekend. And Paddy take them boys and he'd run the shy out and behind the goals. You know, and tomorrow I take the boys and do football with them. So if you weren't on the panels like a month and a half or nearly the guts of two months where you were never on the panel and you're waiting for this in Thursday night, no, you're not on the panel. I was like, oh, Lord, Jesus. But in fairness to Paddy, Paddy, you take it down behind the goals. There's no such thing as him going off doing the football. He'd have you jumping across sticks and carrying lads on their back and all sorts of stuff, you know. But, uh, I was at home. Uh, the boys at home would always... They'd, they'd be witty enough, like every every local pub that all have their characters. And that league, John, that league, you struggled early on, right? And unknowns to party, they had a new nickname from Blow Inventory. They had a OBE. And yes, I, don't know I heard that. It was out, be, out before Easter, the way he was going with the, <laughs> the way he was going with the team. Like, But there was one story. I always remember Desi Dolan said that the first time he saw party bare his teeth, was after a, a performance above in, in Oma against Tyrone, and that was that was in the league, and there was there was a video. <laughs> there was a video. Don't worry, I've been on the end of those things so many times. Like, there was a video thrown on the bus after the game. Was it? You got a bit of a tanking. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I kind of used to be in charge of getting the videos, you know, because I, I I wouldn't. Some of the boys would play cards and different things and talk shit, and I used to kind of like just sitting back, so. I decided myself and a few of the boys would have a kind of, a, I suppose, a different sense of humour to some of the rest of them. So we, I think it could have been, I think it could have been the life of Brian, you know, Monty Python's life of Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, that maybe Paddy mightn't have seen the funny side of. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, there was there was giggles and there was laughs going on and everything, and he was like a fucking bull. So he was, but sure, I suppose. Look at we were after going up to we went up to uh, Oma up in Tyrone, and we got an awful trimming off them. You know, like they were at their they were kind of at their peak. They were the Ireland champions at the time, and they were they were a different class and a different level to us. And I think that kind of hit home. Paddy was like he was just like a bull. You know what I mean? But it was. He always said he clicked into gear when the cuckoo raised his head. You probably heard that before, mm-hmm. often, of course. Yeah. And uh, once we got out of that league, um, you know, we did have a bad old start. Um, but it, we, I think we lost the first two games um, and then we drew with Fermanagh. And then I'm not even sure if we picked up. I, I, we, we, we beat Mayo in the last game and we beat them well. <clears throat> and I remember going into that game. It was the last game. We had to win it. We knew if we won it. We stayed up, but we must have picked up a point somewhere along the way. We hardly stayed up in three points. We must have stayed up in four or something. Yeah. But we beat Mayo and beat them. We could have beat by seven or eight points in the last game. I played well. And next thing, all of a sudden, momentum was with us. There was a bit of uh, positivity around the place. And Paddy arrived in a pair of shorts and a pair of football boots training from then on in. And he was literally training with us. And you know yourself what he's like once once championship yeah. fair comes is close. You know, and it was it was funny as well because you were saying about the OBE. Um, I remember we're, I'm on kind of the awfully Westmead border. So Tubber and Rosemount. My, Rosemount is my club and Tubber um, yeah. is across. It'd be Keir McManus's club. Um, they would have all been, there was no Tubber. They were all Rosemount once upon a time and then they just okay. Tubber set up their own club or whatever. But we'd have to listen to a lot of, we would have always had to listen to a lot of awfully jibing, you know what I mean? And different things. And I'll <laughs> never forget, I'll never forget being, being out for a pint one night um, and a, a lad coming up to me and he was, he was a he was a well known biffo around the place, <laughs> but he he says to me, uh, he says, oh here, Paul, he's going for an OBE or he's getting an OBE, and I was like, what's getting? And he, he kind of led me along and led me along and told me all about it. And this went on, and we in the jacks chatting away for maybe about a minute and a half. And next he says, out before Easter, you use the shower. <laughs> so it was it, it was a real joke that was going around Offaly as well. So when we were, you know, we, it was something we got to Offaly in the first round of the championship and. It was a sweet win anyway, but I always remember that plan. <laughs> to this day, I remember him. But it's... Uh... Well, it was, John, I was looking back in 2004, and, geez, we, we had a great year in 2004 as well, but we were actually, we were all keeping an eye on Westmead and how they were doing, and every game was inside in Crow Park. Every game had history in that Westmead hadn't beaten them in championship and senior championship for so long, and, geez, you got on some role, like, and, say, the big one was the was the... Was the Offaly game the big game? The first round of the championship, getting over that and getting a roll because there were seesaw battles, weren't there? There was fierce freaking games there throughout those games. Like you had you had the Offaly game first, you had the Dublin game, you had the Wexford game, and then you had the two games with Leash. Like 
and yeah. to win the, it was some championship to win like wasn't it because it was a very hard championship to call at the start the dubs weren't what they were no, what they are no the dubs like. weren't what they were and Mead were kind of fading slightly as well I suppose um, and Leash were actually the Leinster champions at the time they had won in 2003 so it was totally different like Leinster was probably the most competitive championship at the time it was hugely competitive but we hadn't beaten awfully in I don't know how many years but it didn't really affect us I suppose it was more your supporters would be going on about that because we've been looking at it for years and years, but it wouldn't have properly occurred to us. But I think I remember after that Offaly game just being so happy, supporters being so happy, and we actually kind of robbed it a bit. I think Brian Morley kicked the point that maybe if, if Hawkeye was in, wouldn't have been given. But um, yeah. that we ended up winning by a point, getting over the line, and it was just a huge win for us. It was massive, and what it meant to everybody. And I suppose we were listening to Paddy all the time, all year, and he kind of kicked into gear for the last league game. And he told us we were going to win. We win that one. He convinces you then that you're going to beat Hoffley. We beat Hoffley. And all of a sudden, yeah. he could tell you whatever the hell he wanted to tell you. And we were going to do oh, it. Yeah. So, you know, you carry that belief on then. And then it was against Dublin. So he loved, he loved playing the Dubs, as you know yourself. You know I what I mean? mean yeah, there, was nothing, yeah. there was nothing better than going in to face the Dubs inside in Pro Park, especially. And that was all around the time. And Jesus, like, it was weird the way the documentary. Of course, he told nobody about Looking cameras, I bet you. He told nobody that this thing worked. <laughs> not a word. He had a very, no. he had a very, he had a very small ego or party, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> a bit bashful, all right. I'd say it's one of the words I'd describe him, you know. But he was a uh, no. Sure, we arrived and sure there was cameras there or something. Like, but in fairness to him, they were very, very good. I suppose as the year went on, if they're there in every dress room and they're there in every huddle and they're there at every train, and they're there every match, you soon no one nearly realizes they're there at all, you know. But he, yeah. he he arrived with them or whatever they arrived with him. So he was that cute. We didn't even know it was a documentary about Pod. <laughs> you know what I mean? We yeah. thought it was a documentary about us in our naivety that someone had wanted <laughs> to do a program about a group of boys in West Mead. You know, but it was I'd it, it was it was so well done. And but no, there was definitely no there was definitely no party coming in and saying, "Lads, would you mind now if I got these lads in to do another video?" <laughs> 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 he didn't try and soften the supper. It was happening. Supper. It was happening. He never had to explain it. He never did explain it, and that was it. You know. I thought I thought Potty was the only man with pishogs, and he had awful pishogs. Jesus Christ! And too many. And he had a pishog actually when he was with Westmead. He'd tra- he'd leave any championship match he had. He'd leave our Devore at three or four in the morning. He'd be up and he'd have the same suit on. He'd go into the cathedral for mass, and he'd meet up then with you after wherever he goes. And he wore the same suit for every mass, every time he had championship, five yeah. or six rounds of championship that you had. Eventually, he actually told us that he thought, he thought he says, these fuckers above here think I have the same suit. I have only one suit, I'd say, because he wore, <laughs> wore the same suit. But I found out, John, you were superstitious as well, like, because Tomorrow Saturday, he says, ask him about the bottle. Ask him about the white bottle, he says. <laughs> I moved on. I've moved. No, no. I've moved on to pink. I, I'm more comfortable with me sexuality at the minute. You know. <laughs> um, no, yeah. The white bottle. Yeah, I got. I used to get an office second about the white bottle. I, 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 I'm claiming to all the boys now, the Gary Castle lads. I'm saying that I, I was always ahead of my time. I, I never shared the bottle. I was a bit kind of strange like that. I'd never, from kind of, I suppose, from merely minor age or whatever I was I just <laughs> and this was a little thing where I wouldn't share a bottle just I and the boys be good enough bottles I'd always bring you on drink you know and it's funny even with the club when I started out playing there was a there was always there'd always be a kid there that had carry me bottle and the, the guy that used to carry me bottle for me for Rosemont for years and years when I was playing his own Carberry and he's now the West Mead goalie so yeah, he's yeah. <laughs> so so it's funny so Owen would have been my own personal war boy for for maybe ten years and I playing with the club but I always have my own white bottle um, and I'd always have it you know taped or strapped and it was probably <laughs> it was that old and that dirty it would nearly walk over to me if I called it from the sideline you know but it was, <laughs> it, was it was it was it was a superstition I have I I bring it out I throw it into Gary Conton goals. I drink out of that, and that was it. And I'd regularly be marking lads, and they'd say, "Give me a drink," and I'd say, "No, piss off, get your own bottle, bestie." And lads were probably thinking I was ignorant, <laughs> but, but lads were really getting in the end. You know, Gary would say, "Oh, he's his own stuff in that." Now he's his own stuff in that. You don't want to drink that. You know, he said, "Boys, be thinking God knows what was in it." You know, but uh, we had it, and we we played the Leinster final, the replay, and we won it. So after every match. I was straight to the goals, I suppose, to get me bottles. So after the first match, the Leinster final, you know, you walked in, got your bottle back into the dressing room. But of course, after the Leinster final in 2004, 
um, all hell broke loose. Yeah, everyone was allowed onto the pitch. I couldn't get to my bottle. I was <laughs> I was exhausted, of course, as well. You were celebrating and you're exhausted. Next year you're getting carried along the place, you know yourself. And uh, I got in anyway and we got the cup. And before we went in, I was trying to get back out to get the bottle. And of course, everyone was saying, don't worry about the fucking bottle. You get the bottle, you get the bottle. But anyway, there was no sign of this bottle. Couldn't find it anywhere. So we're in the dressing room afterwards anyway. And I said to my boss, I can't find this bottle anywhere. It must, it must be out there. And he said, come on. So we had to back out onto the pitch anyway. And there wasn't a sinner left in the place. There was, I, I was walking around the pitch, in behind the goals, behind looking behind the dugouts, everywhere for this bottle. Couldn't find it anywhere. But uh, we never got it in the end. But, you know, it was so funny. There was, it was nearly like, you know, there'd be sightings of the bottle every so often. The boys would be taking the piss. Just someone said the saw it in Munning Gar. Or someone else said the saw it over in Ballon <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> But it was never recovered. Were, you, know? were you aware? Because one thing from the and you probably would have been aware of it more, but the one thing from the documentary that jumped out was the kind of swell of interest that was rising between games from supporters. So you got over Offaly, you got over the Dubs. I'd say after you beat the Dubs, there was severe interest. But by the time you came to Leash, and then the way it happened with the draw and the replay, I'd say Leinster final, like it was, it was, geez, it must have been special. Like it must have been for the whole county, for the players, for everything. Were you aware of that, or were you just tunnel vision, or what way was it for you that time, like? Yeah, it was funny, I suppose. Um, you know, before party came, it was you know it was soak up the atmosphere. It was you know get carried on by the crowd and the whole lot. But I remember party had always said to us, he'd say like, you know, you have to be, you know, you have to be fucking selfish to be successful. You know, and he was saying, you know, yeah. forget about everybody else, forget about your tickets, forget about wives, girlfriends, whatever the hell. Do you know what I mean? This is all about you now. He said you can you can sit back and bask in the sunshine when it's all over. But right now you need a tunnel vision and that's what you need. And I when I look back on it, I would have been exceptionally selfish. I was living with me, I was living at home with my mother at the time, mother and father, and um Sure, I was like, you know, it's probably like like a bear going around the place. You know, if anything was said to me, or you know, there's a young lad there who wants to get an autograph, I'd nearly eat the head off the mother or the father, you know, and you'd walk out grumpily and sign an old autograph and back in you come. But I wouldn't have, I would have been wounded, I wouldn't have kind of drank. Uh, I'd enjoy me pints, but I wouldn't drink when I was playing football, you know, when the championship was on, uh, until it was yeah. done or until you win something or something like that. That's the way it was kind of all or nothing. But um, I would have been very, very selfish myself. So you'd try and stay away from it, but there was just such a swell of support and there was jerseys and there was flags and it was it was nuts, you know what I mean? But we kind of had that, I suppose, when the miners won it in ninety five, it was it was off the charts altogether, you know. And then you had the success that followed. So a lot of us I suppose had gone through it, but it was different with Paddy. What Paddy did was he wanted us detached from the whole thing. He wanted us yeah. separated from it. He didn't. He he liked the fact that when we got onto the pitch, the support carried us. But he didn't want us listening to the bullshit or the shite talk yeah. or the lads blowing you up and different things like that. And he always said, you know, what I mean, the pat on the back is a couple of inches from kicking the arse and you know different old things like that. He'd say to you, and we just did whatever he told us to do. And he'd nearly catch you. And Tomas was like the sergeant major. He'd hear that you know there was three of you driving through Mullingar. Uh, with the windows down the other day, <laughs> we were like, "What the hell are you doing?" And we were like, "Well, we probably were just going up to the shop to get a drink or something." You know what I mean? But Tomas would hear all this. Someone tell Tomas, "Oh, geez, those boys acting the bollocks!" You know, we're driving a car at three o'clock in the day for money. Down. <laughs> he was like, "You shouldn't be doing that. You should be sitting at home resting." And look, that's what we did. You know, but afterwards we enjoyed the whole thing. But definitely, you tried to detach yourself from it. Yeah. Yeah. Was it when you actually won it, John, and when you brought it home? And I presume the homecoming and everything. It was like. Was it, was it as big as the minor victory, like? Bigger? Oh, sure, of course it was. I was bigger. It was huge. Yeah, it was massive. You know, yeah. sure. It, 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 when you look back at it now and you look at the dominance of Dublin at the minute and how anyone is ever going to break that again, it's, 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 we were, you know, we were very, I don't know, I, I do say, if someone ever says to me, geez, weren't you very lucky? You know, and I'd say, well, I don't think personally I was very lucky because I worked fucking hard to get whatever I got, but I was very, very lucky. Yeah. To come along at the same time as all the other very very good footballers. Do you know what I mean? Like I was, I was a long way off being the best footballer that we had in Westmead at the time. But there was a lot of very very good lads, and I was very lucky that we came along at that time. That we kind of all came along together, you know, which which has to happen. But um, the 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 support, I suppose, and everything that was there was just was just incredible, you know. It was like when you went on then, and I, I know and. The Derry game was that disappointing? Was that a was that a kind of a geez that was an awful suck? Because I'd say after winning Leinster, 
he would have found it. I know they had Paddy Bradley, you know, and they had Muldoon, and they had a serious outfit there at the time. But people were fancying Westmead to go on because he would have, if he, if if things had had lined properly, he would have met us in a semi final. And yeah. Was it disappointing? Was it a kind of a sucker punch then to lose to Derry after doing so well and winning the, the Leinster? Yeah, and I mean, it was like we enjoyed, I suppose, I think it was a Saturday evening the replay was. We probably enjoyed the Sunday. We might have enjoyed the Monday. We were back on the pitch on the Tuesday. We were tuned into it and Paddy was, you know, re-emphasizing as, look, you you might never get back here again. You have to you have to grasp this. And everyone was very tuned in for it. But I suppose... <clears throat> All year, we had been kind of underdogs, maybe bar the Wexford game. And then, all of a sudden, we were the favourites going into it. And it just didn't suit us. And they had some exceptional football at the time. And a lot of their team was actually made up of the 95 minor team that Westmead had beaten. Um, yeah. You know, they beat Derry that year. And they had a lot of good lads, you say, Paddy Bradley, Enda Muldoon, and two of them up there. And we actually got, it was probably the only time all year, <clears throat> we got our matchups kind of wrong at the back. I think... Um, Damien Healy ended up on Paddy Bradley and I ended up on Enda Muldoon. And we made the switch when we were a good bit behind. We might have been six or seven points down or something at that stage. And we switched over and two of us got to grips with the two boys a bit better. But um, it was a huge disappointment. You know, a massive because I remember talking in one sense, I remember chatting to the Fermanagh boys that year. Um, I remember talking to them up at the All-Stars and stuff like that. And they had had a good year. I think they were beaten in a semi-final. They beat Armagh or something in a qualifier and they got to a semi-final. But they were saying, look, at at least you have something to show at the end of your year. You know, they, they had got to a semi-final and they'd won nothing. But yeah, it's still, you know yourself, no matter how much success you have, it's never enough. You always want more. Know, and yeah. you, look at, you look at how hard it is to get one now. It's, it, it was such a bloody pity. And I, you know, Paddy, for the league game against Kerry, Everyone knows, you know, he was he just wasn't himself. He he was devastated and he, he didn't want to be there basically. And I've had the same experience with Gary Castle and Rosemount over the last couple of years. I think we're playing against him. I don't enjoy it. But I think um you might correct me, but I think he did want a, a, a go at Kerry in that All Ireland semi final that time. I think he was I think he was up for it and I think he did want yeah. it, you know. Well, he would have he would have loved it, and he would have believed that he were capable of beating us, and that's why he would have loved it. Like, and I think yeah. Miko was the same. Like, Miko really enjoyed say ninety eight with Kildare, um, but it's it's something. There's something there, John. When you play your own gang, even though you're you're connected with them, you still want to get run over them, and you still want to to, to win. Like, you know, you're with whatever team you're with, and that's it. Yeah. Do you know the you you mentioned there the All Stars and. For you to win two All Stars, right? And I, I've won an All Star, right? And it's we've won All Stars when when we've lost. It's still nice to get an All Star, and it's still nice to be honoured in, in in that way, isn't it? If for if, like two All Stars, John is a huge achievement because the second one came in in zero eight, didn't it? Yeah, the second one came in zero eight, and <clears throat> we would have had a Tomas's over the time, and Tomas took over from Paddy in zero six, seven, eight, and nine, I yeah. suppose. So. But zero eight 8 was, was a serious year. We kind of, I remember we went up and played Dublin in a Bourne Cup game and the wallet was out the gap. Then we played them in the league and we had decided, right, you know, Tomás had decided this is the way we're going to play. You know, we're going to play fairly defensive at the time. And it was nearly the same as what everyone is playing now, but we were slightly earlier than a lot of teams. So we had a very good defence and we structured it in a certain way and we had enough boys up front that if we got the ball to them, they'd nick it. And um, yeah. we, we ended up, Going through the league, Dublin Betis in the first round of the league, we came back then and we ended up getting to a league final. Um, and it would have been, it was Division Two league final. Dublin were down in Division Two, probably the last time they were down there, I'd say. Um, but it was a lot of very, very good teams and it. it was really good. That Monaghan team was just starting to come as well. And we bet Monaghan up in Monaghan to get to the league final. We ended up beating Dublin in the league final up in Navan. And we, we probably beat them handy enough in the end. I think it was four or five points, but it was, it was, it was as comfortable a win as anyone would ever have against the Dubs, you know. And then <clears throat> we end up going out in the championship. Uh, we came back and we met Dublin in a Leinster semi-final. I think we beat, she said, I don't know who we, we bet awfully in the first round anyway, and maybe it was straight against Dublin, I'm not sure. But we really, we just, they pipped us by about two or three points and we came back in the back door and we won a couple more games and then we ended up going up to Tyrone. We drew Tyrone in a, it would have been the last round before the quarter final, say, you know? Yeah. So whatever round that we is, three or four. Very unlucky not to, not very to unlucky, them, yeah. You? Yeah, we'd, um, You'd heels, sending offs and everything. Yeah, Dorm was sent off, Dorn Harp sent off. Uh, I think Brian Doher was being the cute Brian Doher that he is. He he uh he was marking Dorn. I think I think there was a little dig one way and Dorn got caught giving him the dig back. 
And as Doran was being booked and sent off, Damien Healy went over to mind, mind do, <laughs> to Mark Tuher. And before the game restarted, Heels was sent off as well. You know, so it was we were down to 13 men for the last 15 minutes and we had a chance at the end, I remember, for a goal that would have kind of I think we were beaten by two points in the end and went on and won the All Ireland. Not to say that we would have won an All Ireland, but we were very well organized. Uh, we were very hard to beat. And I suppose uh, if it was nowadays somebody that had get knocked out in the third round of the qualifiers wouldn't be within an arse's roar of getting an all star. But whatever happened that year, it was stars aligned and I ended up to pick up a second one and it was it was it was nice, you know, you'd always rather the team success definitely from that year. And I always see that as a as the biggest disappointment that particular year, two thousand and eight. I thought we were I thought we were excellent and I thought we were very well set up and it was disappointing not to win something, you know. Yeah, it was you'd always had the job, John, of the opposition, the main men. Like through during those years, like you picked up all the main men, like the Matty Fords, Brogans, all of those players. That was your job. Like it was a freaking hard job. Like because that time you didn't have the protection you'd have now from a lot of teams. Like yeah, no, you didn't have any protection. I remember in the Leinster final, if you look at the clip at the last couple of seconds, I think our three half backs are attacking. Uh, we had Damien Healy, Derry Heaven, and Michael Ennis, and there was no point in telling any of those three boys to stay back because they were gone. <laughs> Desi would be, Desi'd be, further, be closer to me than them three boys most of the time. But it was, yeah, I was always given the job of picking up the name, and I'd always go. I loved Joe you know, once I got into the zone and I was tuned in enough to it, and I knew I was kind of, you know, I, I had a bit of speed. I, I wasn't a brilliant footballer, but I was speed and I was strong enough at the time. And I used to love. Finding out, I'd always be at Tomas, wrecking his head, saying, "Who am I going to be marking? Who am I going to be marking?" And it's only now when I look back and, and I have lads, you know, you're trying to uh, from the other side of from the coaching point of view, and you're trying to get your matchups right, and it's very hard to get them right nearly until a couple of days out. But I'd be at Tomas, yeah. you know, straight after one game, I'd be like, "Right, who am I marking the next day?" And I had to know who it was. And as we got on, it was kind of we had a guy called Mick Sullivan who did a lot of video analysis for us around maybe six, seven, eight, and Mick used to edit down clips for me but he wouldn't do it for anyone else he was like I can't do this for everybody but he, he let it down so if I was marking Matty Ford or whoever it was or Mikey Meaton or whoever it was he'd cut down uh, maybe into a two minute clip what lads are getting nowadays all the time but back then it was ahead of its time I suppose so he cut down a two minute clip of every time you know Matty Ford touched the ball every time Mikey Meaton touched the ball and then he'd analyse the video just of me as well so I was I was spoiled you know what I mean that he was doing that for yeah. me I suppose but I was the only one that was asked him to do it. So he just, as long as I didn't tell anyone else, he didn't mind. But no, I used to love those jobs. I loved them. I loved them. You know what I mean? It's, you know yourself to us. If you're coming up against somebody, you know, the better the better they are, you know, the better you have to be. And it was, it, it gives you that focus. There's nothing worse. I used to find it in club games and stuff like that. You know, if you were going out and you think you were marking a lad that might be brilliant, that's when you lose your focus, lose your concentration or something like that. But if you knew you had to be on, on the ball, on the game for the full game, that was it, you know. You were in the zone, and uh, and nothing to distract you from it. Jesus, yeah, I, I, it was a job that I couldn't like. Mark obviously used to get that job with Kerry and Mike McCarthy and Tom Sullivan. I couldn't do the one on one. John, I'm going to leave you go before I leave you go. Um, the I suppose two last questions. Number one, really, I suppose the one thing with Paddy was he loved travelling, and I know he used to bring you to Sligo, and he brought you down to Inchidani in Cork, and then Jesus, how he got you all out to South Africa and himself back in one piece was was something uh, I'd say crazy. But you couldn't obviously tell some of the stories out there. But he he was actually the man to give you the news of the All Star out in South Africa, was he? Yeah, I mean. You know yourself, it'd be hard to get, get a couple of words with Paddy at any stage because there'd be that many lads trying to pull out of him and talk to him. And especially after the Westmead matches, you never get him. But uh, Tomas, we'd had, I suppose, we'd had maybe nine or ten nights out in South Africa and we didn't, I suppose, take it easy. We were we were letting loose and having the crack. And, you know, it was probably the day, it could have been the day we were coming home. Tomas comes up to me, room knocks stone the door and says, get, get out here, Paddy wants to talk to you. And I was like, Jesus, uh, Tomas, I'm not in the best of shape right now. Come on, let me go. So we went down to the down to the bar anyway, and Paddy was sitting there at the bar with a pint. He says, what do you want to have to drink? I said, I'll have a whatever pint bottle or whatever it was, or a glass of wine, or whatever it was at the time. And uh, he says, uh, he says, I uh, have a bit of news for you. I says, what? And he says, look, just to let you know, he says, you're after getting your roster, I'm after getting a call. So I says, Jesus, that's brilliant, that's great. And we chatted away and Kind of as we talked away, we were sitting there for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and Tomas was nearly standing at the door, making sure no one came in. You know, Tomas would do. He just wanted us to kind of have a bit of time to ourselves, like, you know. And uh, 
it was early in the morning anyway. There wasn't too many boys sitting at the bar about half ten in the morning. Anyway, I can tell you that. But we <laughs> sat there for you know about 15, 20 minutes, and uh, yeah. I was saying to I was saying to him, you know, Jesus, great! Sure, I only have four more to go to catch you, you know. And he kind of puts that he, put, <laughs> he puts down the pint. He says, "Is that your first drink?" I says, "Yeah." He says, "Wait till you have a few more drinks before you start talking shite like that." <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant, John. Uh, the the last question, and I leave you going. Thanks a million. Jesus, I could talk about it all night long. Um, management would the, would in the future, and I'm not saying you have any interest right now, but in the future, is it something that that you'd say, Jesus, I would think about it, or I would love to have a crack at some stage with Westmead, or at, at some level. Ah, you know, I've done it. Do you know what I mean? I'm coaching away at the minute with Gary Castle, but I'm um, I managed Westmead in twenty ones a couple of years ago and we had a great win against um, Mead and I managed Maryland and I've been involved with my own club, I suppose, underage stuff like that. But I think what we have at the minute with Gary is a bit more kind of organized with me to a certain degree and he'd be more off air with technology and all that kind of stuff and analysis and different things and it kind of works for us at the minute. I, I just I enjoy the coaching. I love working with lads and kind of giving a lad time that's going to put it in. And there's nothing better from a coaching point of view of seeing somebody um, progress or, you know, I'd work all day. I'd meet a lad any time of the day, any time of the night, if I knew he was going to give it back to me. And I just love the whole coaching side of it. Management wise, it's kind of a different, it's a different, it's a different ball game. I think the way it's going, it'll always be kind of coach and manager. So I don't know if I'll be going into management, but I'm definitely enjoying the coaching at the minute and I, I, I love where I am. I love the Gary Castle lads. They're freaking absolutely super to work with and we've we've had a bit of success over the last two years and I'm just looking forward to getting this championship up and going and seeing lads progress again and hopefully we'll we'll come out the right end of it with another cup at the end of the year. Hopefully, John, and I hope that you have a successful one and I hope that we have a, a championship in general in Intercounty to look forward to towards the end of the year. It's getting dark on you there. I'm going to leave it's you getting, I'm, only, I'm, uh, look, I'm looking at myself and fading into the darkness here, yeah. <laughs> we're one of the great uh, cornerbacks of any era, by It was a pleasure to talk to you. I wish you all the best. Delighted to have you on Coral at Moss and all the best in the future, John. We'll catch up sometime soon, by All right? That'll do. Thanks a million, Moss. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks a million, by Thanks. Slant, okay. Slant, John. Yeah. Slant, John.